Would you now turn with me to Romans chapter 6. Last week we considered the first seven verses. Today, today we're going to look at another seven verses from 8 to 14. So let's give attention to God's word. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lusts. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Would you pray with me? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, as we consider these words, we pray that your Holy Spirit will speak to our hearts, that you will teach us uh, from these words and encourage us in our Christian walk and our understanding. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Earlier in the, uh, in the earlier chapters of Romans, Paul has carefully told us about the previous condition of a believer in Christ. That before coming to faith in Christ, we were all sinners. Paul then told us what God did through Christ, what he had done for all believers, what God done in you through Christ. And now he comes along and he gives commands. The grace of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ operates before obedience is even a possibility. Gospel obedience only comes when you realise God's work of grace on your behalf. Now, in church history in, in the 4th century, there was a great debate that raged in the church concerning the activity of a believer in coming to Christ. Pelagius, a, 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 in fact he was a British monk, promoted a, systems, or a system of doctrines that emphasised human choice in salvation. Pelagius taught that a believer could freely choose not to sin. Now when St Augustine heard this, he responded by saying that people cannot attain righteousness through their own efforts and are totally dependent upon the grace of God. Augustine uttered these famous words, Lord, command what you will, but give what you command. In other words, Lord, I know that what your law commands me to do, but I don't know how to do it unless you give me the grace to do it. In Romans, Paul is helping us to understand grace. So we move from how God forgives us how God forgives you to what God is doing in you to how to respond to God's grace. Now, I want to stress this point. We're not redeemed because we obey. Rather, our redemption enables us to obey. It's because of who we are in Christ, in our Christian life, which precedes our ability to obey God. Remember the story when God, he, he, God sends Moses to the children of Israel? He sends them to tell them that they were going to be released from slavery. It wasn't on the condition that if you obey the law, I will bring you out of Egypt. Rather, God sent Moses to Egypt to reveal to Israel and also to reveal to the Egyptians a revelation of himself, a revelation of his covenant of grace. 
For God heard the cries of the, the Israelites and because of, of his gracious covenant that he'd made with Abraham centuries before, God planned to bring Israel out of the bondage of the Egyptians. It wasn't until some weeks later that they reached Mount Sinai that the law was given to them. First God redeemed Israel, then he gave them the law. And this is emphasised, of course, in Exodus 20, verses 1 to 3, which David read earlier. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. In the Christian life, it's grace that enables us to keep the law. It's the grace of God working in us that gives us new life and the ability to be obedient and the desire to keep God's law. The law was given after Israel was redeemed. The law did not redeem Israel out of Egypt. It was God's grace that redeemed Israel out of Egypt. Remember the Passover lamb? Remember how the lamb... The, the blood of the lamb was kept and, and then it was painted on the door lintels and the, and the posts. Israel was redeemed out of Egypt because of the blood of the lamb, the Passover lamb, the shed blood of the lamb. Israel was redeemed out of Egypt. Then the law was given in response to God's work of grace. It is God's grace that enables us to do what he has commanded. And in Augustine's prayer, O Lord, command what you will, but give what you command. Lord, what you command is right, but give me the ability to do that which is, that which is right. And Paul has thus far in the first six and a half chapters of Romans told us about salvation. And now he gives a command, he gives a few commands. We also need to note that in the Christian life, justification, which is, how, which is the story of how, or the, the mechanism of how God saves us, and sanctification, which is about us walking in, in um, God's ways, in a holy way, sanctification and justification, they always come together. You cannot separate justification and sanctification. God grants us forgiveness in salvation, thus breaking our bondage to sin, delivering in us uh, from both sin's penalty and its power. In justification, he forgives our sins and declares us to be righteous and he accepts us as righteous. In sanctification, he imparts new life to us through the resurrection power of our Lord Jesus Christ, thus enabling us to become what he intended for us right from the beginning of creation. The problem we have is that many Christians want forgiveness, but they don't want holiness. They're perfectly happy to be forgiven, but not holy. They're perfectly happy to be declared righteous before a holy God, forgiven, but not sanctified. According to Paul, such a thing isn't possible. Justification and sanctification can never be separated. God's forgiveness and God's delivering of us from the dominion and the power of sin in our lives comes together. God just doesn't uh, save us and forgive us, but then we continue to live our life under the bondage of sin. No, no, he doesn't. And so let us consider our passage today in verses 8 to, 6, uh, to 14 of Romans 6. Our resurrection in Christ begins at the new birth, of course, not just at the second coming. When we're united in Christ, when we are raised again with Christ, which not only points to his second coming, when our mortal bodies will be given a glorious and an incorruptible body and united with our soul, but it also points to the present, to the now, with God working his grace in us. 
God not only credits righteousness to us, God imparts righteousness to us by his sanctifying grace. So in union with Christ, when we come to faith in Jesus Christ by the power of his Holy Spirit, we're united with him. The believer is not only dead to sin, but we are alive to Christ. And Paul has already taught this in verses 1 to 7 about what it means to be dead to sin. We're living and walking in newness of life because of Jesus' resurrection. Because of Jesus' resurrection life. The source of our new life is Jesus' resurrection life. Our new life has come about because of the new birth. Now we all know that Nicodemus, he came to Jesus one night, didn't he? We're told, and then Jesus told him about the nature of the new birth. And he emphasises the work of the Holy Spirit. And so when we come to Romans 6, the work of the Holy Spirit is emphasised by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which provides for us the source of new life. And in this newness of life, we experience a radical break with sin. Now, we all know uh, what, well, we're probably familiar with this. Paul says in Ephesians 2, in another one of Paul's books, verse 1, he says this, And you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sin. In Romans 6, Paul emphasises the radical transformation of, work of Jesus. Not that we're dead in sin, but rather that we're dead to sin and alive in Jesus Christ. God's grace provides us with a wonderful transforming power. We are not justified, not only justified by the new birth, God doesn't accept us because of our new life. He accepts accepts us because of what Jesus did. He accepts accepts us because of Jesus' righteousness. And when he accepts us, he gives us new life. Forgiveness and the new birth come together. And so we're justified by grace through faith and we're given the new birth, enabling us by God's grace to walk in a newness of life. God's plans to not only forgive and save us in our salvation, but he plans also to change us, to not only to justify us, but also to sanctify us, not only to free us from sin's penalty, but to release us from the bondage of its power. So we come to some commands in in Romans 6, and we need to know that in God's grace, there's also the ability to obey because there's a change in us to become like our Lord and Saviour Jesus. So what are these commands? In verse 11, Paul says, well, I'll summarise it in this phrase, know who you are. Verse 11 says, likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And Paul's first command is simply saying, know who you are. So appreciate what you have been made to be in union with Christ. Why is this important? Because believers struggle with sin. Now Paul knows that Christians struggle with sin. Not because Paul thinks that Christians want to struggle with sin, Don't be confused with that. When Paul says, reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, you are dead to sin. But when I examine my own life, I don't feel like I'm dead to sin. And that's precisely why Paul is saying this to us. Paul is saying this because we must actively and consciously appreciate what God has done for us in our union with Christ. Now, sometimes it seems that we haven't changed that much. Mature Christians will see their own faults quickly. Sometimes we need to stop and think what the Lord has done. We used to sing a chorus, 
uh, count the, your blessings and know what the Lord has done. We need to think what the Lord has done in our own lives. When Paul says, know who you are, know what God has made you to be in Christ, this doesn't mean that we need to embrace those positive thinkers. You know, the uh, Dale Carnegie's and the uh, Norm, Norman Vincent Peale's and, and all the other modern ones today. He's not saying just think positive thoughts and a change of attitude will cause you not to sin. sin. Rather, Paul is saying, know who you are. You are dead to sin. In the new birth, in Christ's resurrection power, God has made you to be dead to sin. He's not saying to think positively and you become sin free. Rather, he's saying you're dead to sin, so know who you are. Secondly, he's not getting you to visualise yourself as dead to sin. Modern psychology, especially modern sports psychology, teaches visualisation. All those banana kicks that you see in the AFL. Well, they're half school and they're half visualisation. A few years ago, I did a lot of archery. I would visualise, I would visualise hitting that goal. Now you've got to hold that bow steady, and then you release. Of course, you've got to have the proper technique. But you visualise. Paul isn't saying to visualise being dead to sin. And then maybe you become a person dead to sin. Paul is saying this is your reality now. You are dead to sin. He's not saying that you should deny that we ever sin. He's saying recognise that you are dead to sin, the power of sin, the dominion of sin, the bondage of sin in your life has been definitely broken. He's destroyed the dominion of sin, the reign of sin in your life and you need to realise that. It's like a young man who's been single for a long time and then he marries the perfect, wonderful wife but he has a hard, a hard time remembering that he's not single anymore. So he makes uh, major purchases without consulting his wife and he makes social plans without consulting his wife. An older man needs to come along and remind him that he's, he's married. Now he's already married. He just needs to live like he is. Paul is telling you about what God has done for you in his grace, so you need to stop and consider what he's done. Consider yourself dead to sin. Know who you are. You're alive to God. You're alive in Jesus Christ. Know what God's grace has already made you to be. In verse 12, Paul says, that because of who you are, don't be a slave to sin. Look at his words. Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you obey its lust. Now there are three things here. Paul isn't saying that as a believer, since you are dead to sin, you should never sin again. And if you do sin, then you're not a Christian. He's not saying don't ever sin. What he says is, don't let sin reign in your mortal bodies. You are not under the dominion of sin. Your life is not characterised by the addictive, controlling bondage of the desires of sin. It doesn't mean that you won't have struggles with sin. Verse 12 tells us that it's true that sin doesn't reign over us as believers. Now, believers do struggle with sin. Paul is, is, isn't exhorting us not to, to let sin reign. He's exhorting us to not to let sin reign. He wouldn't be doing this if, if uh, believers didn't struggle with sin. If the church was, put, was filled with people who had reached sinless perfection, Paul wouldn't need to remind us, do not let sin reign in your body. Paul knows that believers struggle with sin. So what's the issue? As a believer, your life is no longer controlled 
by the desires of sin. You are not under the addictive power of sin. Your new life in Christ brings you new desires of a new godliness. Paul, in giving a command, this command, realises that a Christian must first recognise who they are. And Paul isn't telling you to become who you're not. Rather, he says, be who you are. Live what God has made you to be. And this is very important for us as believers today. Paul isn't saying to you, become what you're not. Paul isn't saying that you're not a righteous person, so you ought to work at it. Paul is saying that you can't be a righteous person apart from the grace of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you're not a person who is trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, then recognise your own need for, for, for God's mercy and bow down to his mercy, trusting in him alone for salvation. And then he imparts to you a new life. Becoming a Christian is not making a, a new start in life. It's receiving a new life to start. When Paul says, be who you are, he's not telling you to become what you're not. He's saying, act like what God has made you to be. Life in accordance with, with what God has made you to be. Don't let sin reign in your body. Now, there are three phrases in this verse to consider. The last one says that you, that you obey its lust. Paul is pointing here to the realms of desires. Paul wants us to understand when he says, do not let sin reign, that you obey its lust. And knowing that God is doing a work of grace in your lives is that we no longer desire to live a life of sin. We desire to live a life of godliness. We desire to be like our Lord. We desire to see those things that are good and pure and beautiful. We desire after godliness. If sin reigns in your life, it's because your desires are captive to sin. But when grace comes, you are liber liberated from that captivity to sin. New life brings a decisive break with the desires of sin and it brings desires for righteousness. Now, we don't consistently follow these new desires. But thanks to God, we won't always follow the old desires. That's the evidence of God's grace in your life. Sin is no longer king. Christ is king. God is king in your life. His grace is reigning in your life. And Paul is very aware that the body is a conduit for sin that affects our desires. The cravings of sin, lust, greed, pride, lying, and the list can go on. Do not let sin reign in your mortal body. Thirdly, in verse 13, Paul says, And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin. You're now redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, by the Lord Jesus. Your sins are forgiven. You've broken free from the power and the bondage of, to sin, so don't be an instrument for wrongdoing. Don't let your body be used as, a, as an instrument for wickedness. Paul knew that the body could be a conduit for sin. Paul says, be on guard of sin's use of the portal of your body. Men, your eyes can be a portal for sin. Pornography is a portal for sin. So Paul says, do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin. Likewise, women and men, your eyes can be a gate for adultery or the mouth for the use of, and the abuse of alcohol. So be on guard against the members of your body as instruments for sin. Women, the eyes can be a gate for jealousy and envy. When we see someone who has things that we don't have, so our desire is to have those things. 
Someone might have friends and, and we don't have any, so we desire to have them. Someone has status and we don't have status, so we desire status. Jealousy can easily come through the eye. But God is saying to us, look at how the body itself can be used as a portal for sin. Don't let that happen because you're not under the reign of sin and Satan anymore. You're under grace which means that you need to know your weaknesses. You need to recognise your temptations and, and need to confront any sinful practices. You need to stay away from known sources of temptation. Rather, investing time in good habits and activities and depend upon God's grace in your life. For Paul says here, don't allow any part of yourself to be used as an instrument for sin. And finally, in verse 13, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. God wants to give us, he, he, wants all of, he wants us to give all of ourselves to him. How, what's the greatest command? To love God with all your heart, soul and mind. He wants, he wants us to give all of ourselves to a whole being to himself, to present all the members of our body, your body, as well as your innermost being to God as an instrument for righteousness. In light of who you are, a person who is dead to sin and alive to Christ, give yourself to God. Give your body to the Lord as an instrument for righteousness because sin is no longer your master. You're not under law, you're under grace. You're under Christ. People use this phrase, don't they? They use it today, they say, I'm not under law, I'm under grace. And they use it as an excuse to not follow after righteousness. The law doesn't have the power to help you to do what you should. It's only grace that gives you the power to do what the law tells you to do. You're not under law and you're not under the condemnation of the law because you're now under grace. You've been redeemed and you've been forgiven. So do what the law tells you to do because you're not under the law, you're under grace. So in light of who you are, give yourself to God. God knows everything that we do. Do you realise that? The next time you do something a bit suspect, just remember God's knowing what you're doing. We live before his face. This is so important both for our witness and for our assurance. Think about this for a second. Let me promise you this. If you're a believer, you've been forgiven by God and the Lord Jesus Christ. But if you're not pursuing this new walk of faith, this new life in Christ, I promise you that you'll struggle with assurance. Remember David? We, re we read out his famous psalm earlier. David was in the midst of a nine-month nine sin with regard to Bathsheba. And he tells us in Psalm 51 that his bones waxed old. He was under the conviction of sin. Did he have assurance? No, he didn't. God didn't want him to have assurance. He loved him so much, he loved him too much to let him have assurance in that, that situation. If you're not pursuing the new life, you'll struggle with assurance. Friends, how do we lead people to Christ? First starts with people seeing the change in your life. And people see and know that you've been saved. They will see something different. God uses the transformed lives of Christians as a witness to himself and the Lord Jesus Christ. God wants other people to see Jesus in us. And friends, that's the challenge. Can they see Jesus in you? So friends, know who you are. Know who you are. You're alive in Christ today. And don't let sin reign 
anymore in your bodies. Give yourself wholly to God. Amen. Would you pray with me? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, as we consider sanctification, as we consider to become more holy, Lord, and to obey your commands, Lord, and to not let sin reign in our lives. Lord, we pray that each one of us will have victory over sin in our lives. Lord, that we'll be more like you, that people will see Jesus in us, that they'll be attracted to us, not because of our own uh, good looks or bad looks or whatever, but they'll be attracted because they can see something different. They can see Christ alive in us. And Lord, may that be our witness. May that be our experience because we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.